I understand that there are millions of Americans who disagree with President Biden and Vice President Kamala Harris on the terrible war in Gaza. I am one of them. Bernie Sanders released a video addressing the people who are having a hard time pulling the lever for Kamala Harris specifically because of her stance on Israel and Gaza. And look, I'll admit, I was really disappointed with Bernie Sanders on this issue too at times. But even though I've disagreed with him on this issue, he's still one of just a handful of lawmakers who are actually trying to enforce domestic and international law by withholding weapons to Israel. Back in September, he introduced a resolution to block $20 billion in arms sales to Israel. So even though I'm sad that it took him so long to come around to a ceasefire and he still won't call it a genocide, listen, you take what you can get in this system. What I care about is policy and on that front, he is doing what he needs to do. So he is one of the electeds who I think are unquestionably an ally to us. And as the people in Congress, the few people in Congress who are mostly aligned with us on this issue, he knows that Harris's position is hurting her campaign, not just with Arab American and Muslim voters, but with young people as well as people of color. And he released a video where he tries to make the case for her despite that. And what I appreciate about his pitch is that he's not trying to bullshit us. He's not lying about Harris's intentions or gaslighting us about a supposed ceasefire that she's working on. He's just honest with us. So I want to hear him out because what he says here is actually some really crucial points. And some of you are saying, how can I vote for Kamala Harris if she is supporting this terrible war? And that is a very fair question. And let me give you my best answer. And that is that even on this issue, Donald Trump and his right-wing friends are worse. In the Senate, in Congress, the Republicans have worked overtime to block humanitarian aid to the starving children in Gaza. The president and vice president both support getting as much humanitarian aid into Gaza as soon as possible. Trump has said Netanyahu is doing a good job and has said Biden is holding him back. He has suggested that the Gaza Strip would make excellent beachfront property for development. And it is no wonder Netanyahu prefers to have Donald Trump in office. But even more importantly, and this I promise you, after Kamala wins, we will together do everything that we can to change U.S. policy toward Netanyahu. An immediate ceasefire, the return of all hostages, a surge of massive humanitarian aid, the stopping of settler attacks on the West Bank, and the rebuilding of Gaza for the Palestinian people. And let me be clear, we will have, in my view, a much better chance of changing U.S. policy with Kamala than with Trump, who is extremely close to Netanyahu and sees him as a like-minded right-wing extremist ally. Yeah, and he's right. Now, to be clear, there's no guarantee we'll actually be able to pressure Kamala Harris to reverse course, but we're talking about probability here. Harris would probably succumb to pressure more than Donald Trump would succumb to pressure. How likely is it? Who knows? You can't really quantify something like that. We're talking about probabilities. But if there is a 5% chance that Harris would succumb to pressure. That's better than the 0% chance that we have with Donald Trump, because I don't think he would ever succumb to pressure from pro-Palestine activists. Now, we also talked about Ilhan Omar's comments on this issue in a recent video. I'll link to that down below. And she seems more optimistic than Bernie Sanders. And she thinks Kamala would actually be better than Biden on this issue, even though there's no guarantee and she admits that. But she also said something else that really stuck with me. But the genocide does not end with Trump election. True. Uh, the genocide will most likely be worse. Uh, and our ability to advocate as he thinks anybody who is against him is an enemy within diminishes. Yeah. Uh, and so I would like to still have a fighting chance mm. uh, in advocating for the end of this genocide without ending up behind bars. And that is a really bleak take, but she's not wrong. Regardless of how difficult it'd be to move Kamala Harris on this issue, the fact remains that we'd still be able to at least try to move her on this issue. Whereas with Donald Trump, 
our freedom to merely advocate for a free Palestine would be greatly diminished. And this isn't just hypothetical. Ryan Grimm and Murtaza Hussein of Dropsite reported that the architects of Project 2025 have a comprehensive plan to, quote, dismantle the pro-Palestine movement in its entirety. They go on to report the plan, dubbed Project Esther, casts pro-Palestinian activists in the U.S. as members of a global conspiracy aligned with designated terrorist organizations. As part of a so-called Hamas support network, these protesters receive, quote, indispensable support of a vast network of activists and funders with a much more ambitious, insidious goal, the destruction of capitalism and democracy, Project Esther's authors allege. This conspiratorial framing is part of a legal strategy to suppress speech favorable to Palestinians or critical of the U.S.-Israel relationship by employing counterterrorism laws to suppress what would otherwise be protected speech, legal experts told Dropsite News. To achieve its goals, Project Esther proposes the use of counterterrorism and hate speech laws, as well as immigration measures, including the deportation of students and other individuals in the United States on foreign visas for taking part in pro-Palestinian activities. It also advocates deploying the Foreign Agents Registration Act, allow placing disclosure obligations on parties representing foreign interests against organizations that the report's authors imply are funded and directed from abroad. In addition, the document also suggests using the Racketeer-Influenced and Corrupt Organizations Act, or RICO, to help construct prosecutions against individuals and organizations in the movement. The RICO Act was originally created to fight organized crime in the U.S. and particularly mafia groups. Project Esther's authors envision their campaign unfolding in a series of stages. First, the purging of propaganda from school curricula, followed by an intimidation campaign to dissuade students from joining demonstrations and restrictions on social media communication, gatherings, and other forms of coordination between pro-Palestinian groups. The end of the process leads to a moment when both the U.S. public and a preponderance of Jewish community perceives HSOs, short for Hamas support organizations, as a threat to their safety. These steps, Project Esther's authors pledge, will break the pro-Palestinian movement in the United States within 12 to 24 months. So we're not speculating or talking about some abstract plan. They've devised a multi-step plan to crush the entire movement. And they've already named some specific targets that they plan to go after, which includes American Muslims for Palestine, National Students for Justice in Palestine, and Jewish Voice for Peace, which is arguably one of the most, if not the most, prominent anti-genocide organizations in the country with chapters in every state. So if they root out the organizers, that is one way to massively cripple the entire movement because sure, as individuals, we can still choose to go hold up a sign somewhere and bring as many people as we can, but without infrastructure to actually organize massive protests, it's gonna be very difficult for the pro-Palestine movement to get their voices heard. This is why you need organizers and these kinds of movements to coordinate these types of protests. Now, this would be a massive escalation against the pro-Palestine movement if Trump were to get elected. And we're talking about a coordinated campaign targeting all of us to either shut us down violently or intimidate us into silence. I mean, if Trump declares pro-Palestinian advocates a national security threat, what does that even look like in practice? Will pro-Palestinian content creators like Mehdi Hassan or Kyle Kalinske or myself be forced to spend money to defend ourselves if they lob accusations at us for being part of the Hamas support network? I can assure you, most independent media people cannot afford to do that. Will YouTube feel inclined to just deplatform us altogether in the face of government pressure or penalties? Will your employer feel pressure to fire you if they see your pro-Palestine posts on social media out of fear that if they don't fire you, they might be retaliated against by the federal government? I mean, so many Americans already have to sign loyalty pledges to Israel to get government jobs or to give speeches at universities. So is it really that much of a stretch to think that they would expand these anti-free speech measures? We don't know how bad it's going to get and how far it's going to go. But we know that they have a fucking plan to shut it down. And that alone should be taken into consideration. Having said that, though, I understand that people still don't want to pull the lever for Harris because even though they know that Trump would be worse, they just don't want Democrats to think that they can materially support a literal genocide and still count on their votes. I don't agree 
but I get it. In my opinion, Democrats already don't think that they need our votes to win, so I don't think that we have the leverage that we once thought we had. But still, people are pissed off, understandably so, which is why a lot of people in deep blue or deep red states are still planning to either stay home or vote third party. But where it gets tricky is the people who are in swing states, because as hard as it is to pull the lever for Kamala Harris, they know that Trump would be worse. So the question is, what should they do? Well, if it were me, I would personally cast a vote against Donald Trump by voting for the person with the best chance of defeating him. That's Kamala Harris. A third party candidate polling at 1% is not going to win. So I would strategically utilize my vote as a tool to defeat Donald Trump. But with that being said, people aren't going to agree with that. Not everyone will. And if you still don't want to do that, there is this. Swapyourvote.org. So this is one way to effectively cast a protest vote in a swing state while not helping Donald Trump. Now, the way that this works is you match with two Harris voters in a safe state like California, and both of them will agree to vote for a third party candidate in your place if you agree to vote for Kamala Harris in your swing state in order to defeat Donald Trump. Now, for those wondering, yes, this is perfectly legal and constitutionally protected speech. They actually lay this out in the FAQ section where they cite the 2007 Supreme Court case of Porter v. Bowen, which confirms that this is indeed permissible. Now, to be clear, I'm not sponsored by them. I'm not being paid to promote them. I just think that this is an option to consider as a last resort if you are absolutely unmovable when it comes to voting for Kamala Harris, but you still don't want Donald Trump to win. Now, it's not a perfect solution, and you kind of just have to trust that the person you match with does what they say they're going to do, but apparently you can communicate with them and verify votes and whatnot, but I just think that this is an option a last resort for people who are still agonizing about this, but they don't want Donald Trump to win. With that being said, even if you opt to not do something like this, I think it's important that we're realistic about the choices before us. There's no anti-genocide candidate who can win in this election cycle, but there are meaningful differences between Donald Trump and Kamala Harris, even on this issue. But even though this is perhaps the most important issue of this election cycle, there are still other really important issues that we have to think about. And I want to go back to Bernie Sanders and leave you with one more clip from him where he's going to lay out the differences between Harris and Trump in other areas where it's much more clear cut. Because these aren't just aesthetic or rhetorical differences. The differences between both candidates on these issues that he's going to talk about are literally a matter of life and death. So without further ado, here's Bernie's parting pitch for Kamala Harris. As important as Gaza is, and as strongly as many of us feel about this issue, it is not the only issue at stake in this election. If Trump wins, women in this country will suffer an enormous setback and lose the ability to control their own bodies. That is not acceptable. If Trump wins, to be honest with you, the struggle against climate change is over. While virtually every scientist who has studied the issue understands that climate change is real, and an existential threat to our country and the world, Trump believes it is a hoax. And if the United States, the largest economy in the world, stops transforming our energy system away from fossil fuel, every other country, China, Europe, all over the world, they will do exactly the same thing. And God only knows the kind of planet we will leave to our kids and future generations. If Trump wins at a time of massive income and wealth inequality, he will demand even more tax breaks for the very richest people in our country while cutting back on programs that working families desperately need. The rich will only get richer while the minimum wage will remain at $7.25 an hour and millions of our fellow workers will continue to earn starvation wages. Did you all see the recent Trump rally at Madison Square Garden? Well, I did. And what I can tell you is that as a nation, as all of you know, we have struggled for years against impossible odds to try to overcome all forms of bigotry, whether it is racism, whether it's sexism, whether it's homophobia, whether it's xenophobia, you name it. We have tried to fight against bigotry. But that is exactly what we saw on display at that unbelievable Trump rally. It was not a question 
of speakers getting up there disagreeing with Kamala Harris on the issues. That wasn't the issue at all. They were attacking her simply because she was a woman and a woman of color. Extreme, vulgar sexism and racism. Is that really the kind of America that we can allow? So let me conclude by saying this. This is the most consequential election in our lifetimes. Many of you have differences of opinion with Kamala Harris on Gaza. So do I. But we cannot sit this election out. Trump has got to be defeated. Let's do everything we can in the next week to make sure that Kamala Harris is our next president. The Humanist Report is fake news. Mike only cares about Crazy Bernie and his wacky socialist ideas. Sad, very sad. I'm unsubscribing.